Hello and welcome back to the second video in the Expert Skills Program Self-Study Block. In the first video of this series, you learned that students who understand how their brain learns tend to perform better academically. In this video, you will learn about the functional areas of the brain and their role in learning. This information will help you to understand how your intelligence depends on developing all of these areas. Before I begin, remember that filling out the study guide during the video helps you get the most out of what you're viewing. Let's consider first the steps in processing information during a patient encounter before we look at the anatomy of the brain. The raw information which is collected includes the history and physical along with laboratory reports. This is where you will use your senses the most. For example, some of the information is heard during the history or seen and felt during the physical exam. In some cases, such as untreated diabetes, you will use the sense of smell to detect acetone on the patient's breath. The next step involves recognition of the data collected. When you're a novice physician, you will recognize data that you are collecting primarily from what you've learned in your courses in medical school. But experienced physicians recognize data also from their past patient encounters. After enough information has been collected, you will analyze it by developing a differential diagnosis. This will be a list of the possible causes of your patient's problem. As you gain more experience, this list will grow longer, and ironically, as you gain a lot more experience, it will grow shorter. This is because an experienced brain thinks much faster, and you will eliminate some diagnoses from the list unconsciously. Eventually, you will make a decision to confirm the diagnosis, and you will take some sort of action to treat the problem. <clears throat> The action, as indicated earlier, can simply be speaking about verbal instructions or it might be closing a wound with stitches. An important point, though, that I will be repeating quite often is that decisions are always followed by some kind of action. Now, let's match these areas uh, uh, of the brain to this clinical uh, process. A look at this slide shows one half of the cerebral cortex. The front of the brain is on the left, and the four main functional areas of the cortex that you will be developing are indicated by the arrows. The clinical reasoning process can be described in terms of the function of each of these cortical areas. Starting at the back on the right, you can see the sensory cortex. This area has the function of converting all of the sensory information from the history and physical into a form that can be recognized by the adjacent temporal lobes. Other than the need for memory, when you are solving a problem, a major function of your temporal lobes is in recognizing what you experience. If you think about it, you recognize what you see because you remember it. Or as some neuroscientists say, you don't see with your eyes, you see with your brain. Notice that the back of your brain is also identified more generally with processing the past and the present. The next area of your brain that acts on what is recognized contains the frontal lobes. This is an area that is responsible for both diagnostic skills and test taking skills. It may surprise you to learn that there's an equivalence between answering multiple choice questions on an exam and establishing a diagnosis in a clinic. In both cases, a final choice has to be made from a list. In the case of the diagnosis, you've created the differential diagnosis yourself. In the case of a test question, the list has been created for you by a teacher. Again, notice on the left the reference to the future, showing that the front of your brain is uniquely designed to anticipate a future that is yet to happen. 
This is where decisions are made, and as I indicated earlier, it's where action is taken. The area of your brain that creates action is referred to as the motor cortex. The functions include writing, speech, and movement. If you keep this clinical reasoning process in mind, you can now consider how it compares to the learning of concepts. Here we can recount the steps in the clinical reasoning process and compare them to what we think of as ordinary learning in the classroom. The first step in learning involves some sort of concrete experience such as reading or listening to a lecture. It can be viewed as your brain asking what. This step corresponds to collecting the patient's data. The second step in learning involves a reflective observation of the experience to determine if it's something you have already experienced or learned. It could be viewed as your brain asking, so what? This corresponds to recognizing the patient data that you've collected and whether it is normal or abnormal. All of your learning of new information has to pass through this stage where you determine if you already know something. The third step involves your brain creating possibilities from what you have observed so you can decide how to act on what you've experienced. In the clinic, this is developing the differential diagnosis, and in the classroom it is called abstract conceptualization. It's abstract because it isn't real yet until you act on it. It can be viewed as your brain asking, now what? This is the most difficult and important of the four steps in classroom learning, so let's spend a little more time on it. To ask now what, you have to be asking, what is this like? What is this different from? What is this caused by? And is, it is at this point in your learning that you may be tempted to take a shortcut. It takes extra time and energy for you to do this guessing game and it feels like a waste of time. The temptation is to just settle for recognition of what you're trying to learn and leave it at that. But you will shortchange your learning with this kind of shortcut. The fourth step involves acting on your decision. In the clinic, this can take the form of communication with the patient about the treating, treatment plan. In the classroom, learning this is, is called active testing because it can be viewed as your brain testing the way you have decided to organize concepts that you're learning. Let's put all this together in the next slide to look at how your brain learns facts and concepts. When I think about what clinical reasoning and ordinary learning have in common, I find two things that stand out. First, the steps in thinking are the same and the areas of the brain are the same. Back in 2002, James Zoll showed in his book, The Art of Changing the Brain, that the steps in experiential learning match the functional areas of the cortex. So the arrows and the ellipse point in the direction of information flowing through the brain as it is processed into learning. The reason to return here to the anatomy of the brain is that I've been making reference to helping you develop skills. This picture of the brain helps you see that each separate area represents a separate skill that can be developed. For example, if your frontal area is more skilled than your temporal area, then you will need to learn how to study in a way that brings more attention to your more limiting skills in memorization. A very important feature of the ESP is that skill development is never left unbalanced and all other skills are developed. You will in effect become a whole brain learner. In the next video in this series you will learn about learning style and you will find that learning style is simply a tendency for you to use one of these areas more than the other. Emphasis on either one of these areas is a natural and normal way of thinking for everyone. And the good news is that once you recognize which skill you unconsciously emphasize, you can work on developing the skill that you don't emphasize. 
Let's summarize the relationship between the anatomy of the brain and the way it processes information. One generalization that will help you remember the way your brain learns is that you think back to the future. The back or temporal cortex helps to recognize facts and patterns because that is where they're stored. This area of the brain also serves as a reservoir of information for the frontal area to use in decision making. This is also the area of the brain that is used most in pre-medical education where the focus is primarily on memorization. The front or frontal cortex makes decisions about the future by analyzing information that it receives from the back of the brain and also from the sensory cortex. The front is the area of the brain that is both creative and logical. It discovers new patterns by making guesses and it also makes inferences. This all applies to your learning for two important reasons. First, learning is really nothing more than organizing and even reorganizing to make remembering possible. Organizing requires guessing and finding patterns and making decisions about the, how to organize them or, or the best pattern. And the expert skills methods show you how to do this very efficiently. The second reason is that remembering your learning requires action of some kind. Your brain will simply not convert what you're studying into long-term memory if you don't act on it. So the main message here is that you always want to be using the front of the brain by making decisions. It will automatically make use of the back of your brain to produce balanced development. Just remember that your study should always involve making decisions and then acting on them. Now, let's summarize what I've covered in this video. Your brain processes information using four major areas of the cerebral cortex, each having a different function. It does this whether in the clinic or in the classroom. Active learning builds learning skill in each of these areas of your brain. In the next video, you will learn about your learning style and how it relates to your future specialty choice. I look forward to having you join me there.